going on up there to try to make it easier for small businesses to do business out in Worcester County. I've gotten to know him as a person, he's very ethical, a uh, great guy, he works very hard for our community. And so uh, without any further ado, here's Sheriff Blue Evangelist. Thanks for coming. Now I want to be clear about it. I'm not the tall sheriff, but the high sheriff of Worcester County, okay? I may be six seven, but Anyway, I want to say thank you, congratulations, Dr. Sutton. Where are you? Where is he at? Dr. Congratulations, well deserved. He's done a tremendous job with the Rotary. I've been here before and I also uh, back again, but I know how hard he worked with a great job and congratulations for that wonderful recognition. Thank you. So Brad, thank you for your kind introduction. You've been a great friend of me for a really long time and uh, I'm proud to call you my friend and thank you for extending this invitation today. Um, and thank you for all you do through the Rotary and the great work you do. And, you work with so many people. Is it roses that we just saw each other last week, right? The roses, right? Yeah, nice to see you again, too. Uh, Claremont Academy. She works over at Claremont Academy. We had a reading day for some of the kids in the school last week, and it was a wonderful school. They're doing great work over there, so it's nice to see so many in person, of course. Uh, crowd of family, the happiest people in Massachusetts yesterday or two days ago. Two feet of snow. They like it. Maybe three feet. But anyway, I just wanted to tell you just a little bit. I've been here before. I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I do with Sheriff, and then maybe we can do a few questions and answers, but the one thing I'd like to talk about, because it's kind of such an interesting job, is I can talk about a hundred different things, and I also only have a limited amount of time, and I can talk fast, so I can go in a couple different directions, but the one thing I'd like to talk about, why not just talk about like today? Talk about yesterday. That's how interesting this job is. Today, I just came from Quabbin Regional High School, so I was running a little bit behind schedule. I had a couple people in Barry to see. I was up at the Quabbin Regional uh, High School speaking to the 9th and 10th graders, bringing a program, which I'm bringing to Claremont actually, you've already been reached out to on it, but it's about the choices young people make today regarding drugs and alcohol. 90%, 90% of the inmates in my jail and 90% of people in the criminal justice system are in prison because of choices they made, usually in middle and high school, involving drugs and alcohol. So when you're sheriff, and I'm doing everything I can to rehabilitate people, I'm willing to I'll be the first one to throw the key away and put bad people away. But I also know that a lot of those people, thousands of them, who come through our facility at the Worcester County Jail House of Correction are going back to your communities, are going back to your neighborhoods. And I want to make sure we've done everything in our power to make them less likely to commit crimes than when they got there. And that's really hard work. You know, and I'll just say this briefly, I don't like to talk about the early stuff, but you know, there was a perception of this job when I got, got elected, when I ran for it. There was patronage and politics and nonsense. And you know what? I worked hard to stop that. You know, I did things like, I'm the only sheriff in Massachusetts, the only sheriff in Massachusetts that does not take employee contributions. I will not shake employees down. You get hired because we raise the hiring standards. Highest in Massachusetts. Harder to work for us than it is to park the correction. You need to have an associate's and a bachelor's degree, military and a military service. You have to pass a written test, a physical test, a psychological profile, all these things before we will bring you in. Because I want to make sure we get the best people, whether they're teachers or whether they're uh, substance abuse counselors or correctional officers or nurses or whatever, everybody who works there should have one goal in mind. When these people walk out that door, they're less likely to hurt you and your family than when they got there. And it's really hard work. I mean, we're talking about a, a, a success rate of probably 50%. But we have to work hard, and I think that's why you entrusted me, at least some of you did, um, to do this job. And I'm really thrilled to have a chance to do it for you. But one of the things I learned, back to what I did today, when you start sitting in that jail and you talk to inmates, talk to them, they're human beings, most of them anyway. That wasn't uh, funny, funny, but, um, you know, I talk to them. And you know what they tell me constantly is these choices they made. They wish they could go back to middle and high school and start over again. And I thought, why wouldn't I, as sheriff, want to bring that message to middle and high school kids? Why wouldn't I want to tell them, show them a picture of an inmate. Talk about his life in prison. Talk about the fact that an inmate doesn't have a toilet seat. I have a film of an inmate saying, that's how the whole thing starts. Sitting in a prison cell. No toilet seat. Because it's a weapon. Can't have a towel if he wants to wash his hands. Because he could strangle himself or someone else. Doesn't get to choose what clothes he wears. Doesn't get to go to the bathroom without, without being watched by a camera. I tell the young people, think twice. Because the inmates tell me they wish they could start, roll the clock back, go back to middle high school and start over. And they would make different choices. And invariably, 
drugs and alcohol is what sends them to prison. When I talk to judges, when I talk to the DA, when I talk to anybody in the court system, we all know if you could take substance abuse and drugs out of this system, our courtrooms would be empty, our jails would be essentially empty, but we can't. Unfortunately, we have, for whatever reason, a complex societal problem involving drugs and alcohol. So, the sheriff, I brought that program, I bring it to the schools, I show them videos and interactive with them. And I show them videos of Lindsay Lohan and Charlie Sheen and Eminem. And I put this program in front of over 125,000 students since I've been sheriff. Some people said, well, Jesus, I thought the sheriff just hires his friends and puts his feet up. Not this sheriff. I can promise you that. I was elected to help solve the problems of this county. What a blessing it is to be your sheriff. I mean, I am blessed to have this job. And to have this job, I take the responsibility of trying to help us stay safe. So this program, I bring to schools. I think I've been to virtually every school in Worcester County. They've had me go to Springfield. They've had me go to Lowell. Um, Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito are very excited about this program. I'm going to be appointed to the task force on substance abuse that the governor is putting together, and part of it is going to be this program that we developed. Me and, and Kim and Bill Tebow, who just left Coahuila, we developed this program ourselves. We're the only sheriff in the country doing it. But it's making a difference. You know, we're trying to make at least, you know, one girl came up to me today talking about the problems her family had. She has predispositions to substance abuse, and she's fighting it, you know. And she talked to me a couple of years ago when I was at Coahuila, uh, previously, the middle school. So we're working, and kids are fighting, and they're struggling, and it's hard. But all we can do is try to help give them the awareness to think twice. Not every kid's going to be receptive to this message. Unfortunately, I know that in any school, probably 25% of the kids are already involved in drugs. Maybe 25% aren't going to be involved at all. There's a lot of kids in that middle, our children, our grandchildren. And I want to make sure that we've done that. So we go into schools. That was today. If you happen to look at the paper today, maybe you saw this. We've got debates at the jail. I called the city manager uh, at Augustus. We offered our inmates to get out in the city of Worcester, and they were shoveling out walkways, and, and they were helping the city clean up, and the same thing we were doing up in Lemonster with May and Rosarello. We're putting inmates to work, and since I've been sheriff, one of the programs I've really focused on, I have quadrupled the size of the inmate work program at the jail. It was a small one I started. It wasn't, I didn't think it was very effective. We quadrupled it. Since I've been sheriff, we've put over $5 million worth of free labor out in Worcester County. And if you're a nonprofit, you're welcome to give us a call. We need something in writing on the letterhead of the nonprofit, and we can bring a work crew out to help you, whether it be clean up a ball field, paint a town hall, anything, any churches. We do incredible work, anything from painting to scraping to cleaning up. We put in walkways. The inmates get a lot out of this program. That's what's amazing. And I'll tell you this I, just, I asked this question rhetorically. But imagine a government program. When I go out there, the people that are recipients of the program, town manager, the ball field director, will say, Sheriff, thank you so much. You're doing this work. You saved us tens of thousands of dollars in a week or two. We've just had a veteran shelter up in Fitchburg. We were helping fix. We gave three weeks to veterans because we prioritized programs with veterans. Three weeks we gave them. They redid the entire building, took walls down. Some of our inmates have skills. But you know what? They thank me. Sheriff, thank you. you. Saved us tens of thousands of dollars. The inmates were very helpful. They were respectful. I'm trying to have them get an opportunity for employment when they get out. Because the inmates tell me this, Sheriff, thank you for letting me be in this program. Because now I, for the first time, one inmate told me, 25 years old, he's been in gangs his whole life. He said, Sheriff, this is the first time in my life I get up in the morning, I get up and I go to work, and I have dignity and self-respect. I feel good about myself, Sheriff, and I can't wait to get out. I'm not going back to those gangs. I want to make my family proud of me, and I see a better way. That's what an inmate told me. And I'm thinking, and this is the rhetorical question for you, name another government program that saves you millions of dollars, save now, not cost, and actually turns people's lives around. That's a pretty darn good program. So I'm really proud of that. So if you saw the TNG today, there's an article. Our inmates are out there cleaning up after the storm, giving back, and at the same time getting a lot out of it. Let's roll back the clock two more days. I mean, I could go on and on. You know, I'm just going, this is the week of the life of the sheriff. <laughs> Last week, we had a very big press announcement with Congressman McGovern, with uh, DA Joe Early, but it was the sheriff's department. We were the recipients of the largest federal grant in the county's history. Sheriff's Department received one of only seven federal grants, second chance grants, in the whole country. We had to put together an application. I'd like to believe 
And I'm sure of it, that we received it because of the work we're doing, because we're turning things around up there, because we're focusing on these issues. This money is going to allow us to open up what we call a new man's unit. Now imagine, and I'm not crying poverty to you here today, because I know a lot of you work in business and you know how hard it is to employ people and keep you know, food on your table, and we all know that. But the inequity of the sheriffs is, is awful. In Middlesex County, for example, has fewer inmates than I do. Their budget's 45% more than mine. It's crazy. Other departments have a whole orientation unit. Someone comes into their jail, they get a week to spend in this separate facility where they orient the inmate to the facility. We had about 10 minutes. And we had to send them out to double bunk and triple bunk cells to figure out who's in what gang, who's detoxing from what, to get them started on this process. We want reentry to start at day one. When you set foot through the Worcester County Jail, I want to start working on you. Get you in a place where if you want to help yourself, and not all of them do, let's be honest. Not all of them do. I can't force somebody to turn their lives around, but I can offer them no, if they don't want the services, they're not going to get them. We're not going to waste your time and your tax money to try to help people don't want to help themselves. But there are people that want to help themselves, and those are the ones we reach. This reentry grant, which was matched by the Worcester Health Foundation and ourselves, is going to be $1.5 million over two years. We're going to be able to have a new man unit. We're going to have to clear out, with no money for to do this, we have to clear out 54 cells, put inmates into it, we have to rearrange the entire facility to open 54 jail cells. So when people come in, we'll have an opportunity to get them into that area for maybe three days, four days. Assess them. Find out what their needs are. Get them on that pathway to turning their lives around. And then we can start focusing on the programming which suit them best and help their re-entry. And by the way, we're going to follow these people at Brandeis University and see how our results are. And we're going to, our goal is to reduce recidivism by 50%. Now that sounds like a number, and it is a number. But think about it, if we reduce one crime, if your family is not hit by a drunk driver, if your family's house isn't broken into, if your neighbor's uh, kids aren't being dealt drugs to, how do you put a price on that? One crime, I think, costs community $100,000 between the police time, the arrests, the court process, the prison time, $46,000 a year. Or we can turn people's lives around one at a time, never mind the cost to you know, to the, to the system, but the incalculable cost to people in human lives. So that's what we focus on. I mean, that's our goal. That's what I've been blessed to do. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity, Sheriff. I love this job. I'm very passionate about it. Uh, I feel I'm blessed to be given the responsibility that you and the citizens of Worcester County have given me. And I just look at it as every day a chance to help make our community a better place. And it's a blessing to have this job, and I'm so appreciative of it. I'd like, if there's time, to take a few questions. I don't know where we're at as far as time goes. But are we good, Brad? Or oh, you're good. Just, I'm, I'm sorry, Mitra, are we uh, good for time? Sure. John, we'll start from here. I think he beat you by half a second. Uh, I spent 32 years as a probation officer. So where did you work? I worked starting out in the uh, Ferdinand District Court. Spent about 15 years in the Worcester District Court. So I'm very familiar with the statistics that are always used about drugs and alcohol. I just want your thoughts on this. And you, you just cited the figure now, $46,000 a year per inmate. I was very frustrated. I, I consider that putting money on the back end of the problem as opposed to the front end of the problem. When you're really getting at root causes of poverty and crime, Yep. Dealing with a school like Claremont, yep. where they have, they're, they're going from kindergarten right from high school, and there's a perception that maybe dollars aren't well spent in a school like that. If you take that one fund, which is about $46,000, you take that kind of money and put it on the front end, dealing with education, health, and all those things, <coughs> what is your opinion about having those dollars spent on the front end as opposed to the back end that where the criminal justice system typically spends the money? Yep. Well, I get your point. I think we all do. We hear your point. I think it's a valid one. It's hard to argue against it. Um, I think you can take anything. I mean, healthcare, for example. You know, if we, if we had people, I, I always have the attitude, I think government ought to give people, we should open up gyms and force people to go. Have them pay X amount and then give the money back every time they go. You know what I mean? Like, those kind of creative thoughts. Like, let's make sure if people were healthy on one end, we'd have a lot less cost on the other end. No question about Claremont Academy and schools getting involved early in the process. Um, so there's no question. That's why I go into the schools. Like I came here from Quabbin because I'm trying to get ahead of the problem. It's very complex though, and I will say, it's funny because we talked about that very issue. 
part of my thought with Claremont Academy, for example, which deals with mostly kids in the city, in the city from that particular neighborhood, mm -hmm. some have very tough environments, it's a very supportive environment, they're doing great things. I sat at a table with all girls, I have two girls, so I'm very comfortable with my, my table, of, they were mostly freshmen and sophomores. Um, but they were kids that were really struggling, they had hard times, but they were turning their lives around. The school offered them a great support network. So I'm all for that. But I feel like we can't just stop the questions there. Let's keep going back. We gotta get to the root of why are people being born into single family homes? Why do we have the poverty thing? So yes, you have to get there. But those are for, unfortunately, not me to handle on that sense, because I'm sheriff. And all I can do is try to deal with, unfortunately, kind of the end results of it. But we're doing what we can to go back as far as we can. It's all for all of us to solve. You know, we all have to work on this problem because it's real. It's only getting worse. And we as a society have to focus on it. But the sheriff, I can only focus on sort of the criminal justice side of things. And I think the biggest issue is 90% of inmates are incarcerated in committing crimes. I mean, the one thing, and everybody may will tell me this, and it was in my presentation today, but why I do not support legalization of marijuana, why I do not support this sort of movement afoot, because there's no question in my mind, marijuana is a gateway drug. When you get high, it changes everything. Now, does every kid get high and move on to prescription drugs? <coughs> but most of them do. Most of the kids that are on prescription drugs have either started getting stoned, getting high, and then moving on. So there is a gateway component to it. So I'm working on things like that. I'm working on the substance abuse issues that come to us and trying to get a handle on those. And I think that's where we have to go. But it's a very complex question. Yes, I agree totally. We need to sort of move backwards from the end of the equation and put the money up front. But it's very hard. You know, society seems to deal with the emergency rooms instead of finding a way to keep people out of emergency rooms. So that's all I can say in it, but I agree and I could, you know, that's a complex question. So yes, sir. Three parts. One, um, I'm concerned that uh, concentrating on drugs and alcohol uh, in the absence of dealing with the underfunded public mental health system this is the point. Uh, and wondering whether or not uh, the, the mental health component to the kind of treatment and options you're talking about is as robust as it needs to be. Secondly, um, I wonder whether or not um, we are um, have uh, we need to reprioritize by looking at the for-profit penitentiary system in this country that uh, seems to be to put the incentives in the wrong direction. Um, in terms of Which one does the privatized ones? The privatized ones. So in other words, being paid to to continue to incarcerate. And three, um, wondering what if any spiritual component to the the uh, process uh, you have incorporated into uh, your system. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Why don't we start with the uh, spiritual part? The simple one. Uh, I'm a big believer in. I said one time we wrote a group and everybody laughed. I didn't realize it was. I think it was funny, but I guess it was. He said, "I said I don't care. I try to bring needs in. You ever heard of needs? It's a dog organization. They train dogs to help like veterans and things. They're in Princeton. I want to bring needs to my jail. Have my inmates work with dogs because I said I don't care if you find a dog or you find God. And even turns your life around. I'm all for it. The dog and God are back and forth. I guess so there's some symmetry to that conversation. But the truth be told, I don't care what it is. I'm a big proponent of spiritual ministries. They work. People can find God. I found this. When people turn their lives around in prison, which is my main population I focus on. Now, I run also centers, which we talk about at length. These correction centers in communities that help keep people who are on probation out of prison by keeping a closer eye on them and intense programming out of prison. Because that costs $4,000 a year, and prison costs $46,000 a year. So there's a whole other component. But I'm a big proponent of it. I've expanded the uh, prison ministry program since I've been there. I've got a pastor, Janice Ford from Webster. She's leading our group, and we're trying to expand it. So every inmate gets the opportunity to get to know a spiritual advisor while they're in prison. And when they're released, we hope they can transition into that community and have a sense of support network, you know, whether it be housing or medical or jobs or substance abuse, a spiritual proponent too can be a big part of it. So a big proponent of that. The other two points, uh, which one do you want to start with? Um, let's see, the first point you had was uh, mental health issues are immense. And let me say this to you, on mental health, and it's very complicated. I'm probably not qualified to give you the, the mental health analysis that you probably need from someone with a, a doctorate or a medical degree in that. But about 40% of my inmates are on some sort of psychotropic meds. It's probably about 35 or 40%. I know some counties, like Suffolk County, it's over 50%. 
So there's a huge medical component. And one of the things, if you're familiar with this issue, remember like Rutland State Hospital, uh, Belchertown State Hospital, remember all these state hospitals, Worcester State Hospital, remember they all closed, and it was always like, it's a big deal. 1970s. 70s. Well, it's interesting because, you know, that was an interesting, I've read about this. It was an interesting confluence of events. It was one of those rare moments that the conservatives and liberals came together and agreed on something. The conservatives thought it was a waste of money and liberals thought it was inhumane. And guess what they did? They closed them. And everybody thinks, well, the problem went away. That was good. You saved money. Uh, well, why don't you come up to my A1 and A2 unit if you want to see where the problem went. Because I have, we have, we have basically mental health hospital wards we run at the jail. Now these are being supervised essentially by correctional officers who are not really trained, you know, as best we can. They're not psychologists, so we have we have over almost five million dollars a year in my medical costs alone in my prison. Five million dollars of my budget goes to the medical costs. Part of that, a big part of that, is mental health services and things. So it's a big component. Um, it's complex, and yes, it feeds into a lot of substance abuse issues. But candidly, I, I don't have enough time to get deeper into the issue. And the second issue, I'm sorry, I just wanted to go I'm just wondering point. about the for-profit penitentiary system. I can't speak a lot about it. For Texas, for example, does it. Uh, I don't know a lot about it. I haven't educated myself on it. I understand your point that there's a bit of a conflict when if you want to reduce you know, uh, people's incarceration, but you're paying people to incarcerate. I'm not, I'll tell you what Texas has done. Texas was at one point the biggest throw the key away incarcerating state in the country. And that's why they needed to privatize. They had so many people. <clears throat> Texas actually is leading the nation now in saying we need to find a better way. They've been leading the nation. And I think Massachusetts has been big on that too, the type of programs. But I'm letting you know, Texas, the Governor Perry has said, no moss, no moss this. We don't have the budget for this, so we gotta start coming up with creative solutions to this. And they're, I think they're moving away a little bit from the privatization. Uh, which I don't have any objections to. I mean, something like privatization works very well. So that's something, you know, I just don't know the details within the correction system. So, and I wanted to, this gentleman had a question. Yep. Yeah, um, we are actually moving forward with a project that involves painting. So could you give a few details about what would happen if we have some of your inmates coming? Where would project? you be doing it? In Worcester. Where? I mean, non-profit? At least a non-profit. If it's your house, it would be a little more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I had somebody, like, somebody we had a picture story online yesterday, a couple of comments were, they should be shoveling out, like, my driveway. I'm like, well, the problem is, that's how I get in trouble, you know? I'm like, so, and I, but I will back it up and say this to you. Now, I'll, I'll give you one second. It, it is a non-profit. Yeah, as long as it's a non-profit, all you have to do, we have some flyers we'll hand out. They have contact information. You reach out to us, we'll have uh, Lieutenant Hines will come out, he'll talk to you, he'll assess your situation. If it's winter work inside, we'll try to get to it sooner. If it's work that we can do outside, because it's painting perhaps outside, we would probably schedule it for the spring or the summer. And that's how we operate. But, so yep. you have a guard there? Or... Oh yes, let me be clear on this. There are about four, to th three to six people, that's a very good question, three to six people uh, in these crews. We have four crews out today in Worcester County. Yesterday we had two in Lemister, two in Worcester. Um, four crews. Three to six inmates, they are the best inmates we have. You do not get in this program unless you've earned your way in. Non-violent, non-sex offenders, um, people that have earned their way in this program, they're supervised by an armed guard, and we have had, knock on wood, please tell me there's some more here. Um, we have had very few, if any, problems. I mean, maybe a call once, like, what are your inmates doing in our neighborhood? That, that, you because know, we had, like, for example, there was a church parish that the pastor lived in was in a neighborhood, people called. Almost. You know, God blessing, willing, you know, a, a really positive win win program. That's how you do it. The only caveat I want to mention is you guys follow the whole graffiti issue. Remember what was going on in Worcester last year, pretty big? Well, I thought we should help. The sheriff's office can help. So I invested. We bought a graffiti removal truck. And I'm going to have my inmates out there to remove graffiti. And it's going to be done for private and public. I want you to know that. Because I don't believe when private businesses get victimized, and I know this, I've heard it, and I'm not blaming the city, I'm not blaming the businesses, but they sometimes feel like we're the victims and we're treated like the criminals. And we're told if we can't get this off our property in a week, you know, that you're going to be, you're going to be fined in all this. So my attitude was, I'll take the heat. Somebody will somehow say, oh, Shutter's out there removing graffiti from his friend's buildings. I see Chris is already moving on, he's got some graffiti. He wants <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the point is that, you know, we will do it, and we'll do it for private business, but that's a rare exception, because I think when, I believe that, that graffiti is like a weed, and if you don't stay on top of it, it spreads, and it's a blight on our community, and I, as sheriff, want to get rid of it. And I don't care where it is, I'll help the communities, and it's not going to be just Worcester, it's going to be everywhere. 
we're kind of kicking up the program now. It'll be fully effective in this spring. So, is that good on the program? That's good, thank you. Yeah, we have it. We will do it, I promise you. We get to, we do so many projects. I don't know, how many projects do we do a year? Do you know how many? We're, well, cumulatively, we're over 1,000, and we've saved 5.5 million for Worcester County nonprofits and municipalities countywide. So. so we're over 1,000 projects. So I promise you, if you reach out to us and you fit our criteria, I mean, I don't want to put in me, it's like somebody said to me, can they shovel our roofs off? Uh -huh. I'm like, well, I, you know, my job is care, custody, and control of my inmates. I can get sued. I promised when I got elected, I was 20 years, I practiced law. I don't want to be like, you know, sued. So I'm trying to keep them out of harm's way. But short of that, I'll have a work for you. Yep. Uh, one comment and one question. Uh, if you're talking about substance abuse, maybe you shouldn't have introduced yourself as the high sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I can quantify that exactly. I mean, can you, can you explain, you mean as far as like a predisposition or something? Correct. In other words, it sounded like you were saying that a fair number of these people have addictive personality disorder. And I'm wondering if there are other people who, who don't have such disorders but just get caught up in the whole level thing. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's, it, there's, a, there's probably many different areas. I'll, I'll tell you the reason I, this is part of the problem, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be candid with you on this part of it. You know. I don't look for excuses, because there's always excuses. I think we live in a society where nobody's responsible for anything anymore. It's always somebody else's fault. I'm a drug addict, it's my mother's fault. I'm a drug addict, I was predisposed. You know, if you're a victim of a crime, let me tell you something. If you're walking home and somebody beats you up and robs you to feed a drug addict, you're no less of a victim than if they're not a drug addict. You know what I mean? Your life will never be the same. So we got to get to the root cause of it, and, we have to, and that means to stop the crimes from occurring. But to get deeper, we have to figure it out. And yes, there are people. I, I can't give you a number, but I'd say probably half. Half people seem to come in with predispositions. I'll give you one thing, and I'm sorry to how long we are in time, but this is really interesting. What's that? Oh, thank you. You sure about that? Okay. So the room just deflate. But um, the, uh, you know what's interesting? I was reading about. Percocets, and this is the one, you know, the, the, the painkillers, prescription painkillers, and the Percocets, and the Vicodins, and the Oxys, okay? We all know they're out there. And by the way, if you've got them in your, your cabinet at home, the, today's parties, remember BYOB? Come on, somebody, right? We know what the party is for, right? Come on, BYOB. You know what that is, right? <laughs> you know. So, today's BYOP. Kids don't show up with booze anymore. That's like beaver cleaner stuff. They're showing up with pills or pharmaceuticals. BYOP, bring your own pharmaceuticals. And one of the things that's fascinating about this, this gets into sort of a predisposition, I think, of the cognitive development of a brain, is that when you're 15 years old, now I was, I was with a doctor who was at a seminar talking about this. They knew the brain development. And I guess, like, for example, I think we all know if you have kids and grandkids, kids develop the, the, the gas pedal before they develop the brake. You know what I'm saying? But we all know that, like they get the idea of the gas pedal, they just haven't figured out the brain yet. Well, the development of the brain works like that, and one of the problems with young people is sometimes they feel a little less of an insecurity, or they feel like um, you know, they're just not comfortable in their own skin yet. What if they find a way to take something at a party, someone offers them a Vicodin or a Percocet, and suddenly they have this, this sort of calmness comes over them that they feel like, I like this feeling. They don't understand. They haven't really developed the thought of why or what it is. They just know, so they kind of like want to do it again. And that's how these, these addictions can develop. So is that a predisposition or is that a cognitive development issue? You know, That's one of the things we see. So it's complex, and there's no easy answer to it. But clearly, that's a component of it. That's what that girl, one of the girls was talking to me today. She said, my dad's an alcoholic. I'm very concerned about drinking. You know, How do you feel I should approach it? And I, you know, I told her was, you're aware of it? That's hugely. You know, that's a huge step forward to have an awareness that you have to be, everyone has to have an awareness, but some people are, think are predisposed. So I'm, I'm of the believer that there is predispositions in some people's and families, my own included, frankly, by the way. As I tell young people, my family's been touched by alcoholism, by drug abuse, by incarceration. So it can happen to anybody. Uh, international statistics are interesting. I read that the United States 
incarcerates a greater percentage of our population than any other country in the world. That's astounding. Mm -hmm. And if you look at who's in prison, <coughs> they're not all murderers and rapists and, mm -hmm. and armed robbers. Um, there's a large percentage that are in for nonviolent crimes. And those are the people you bring on the work details. Um, so, I, and we can talk a long time about that and what to do about that. The other issue I had, if you arrest narcotic addicts, they go right into your facility, still high? Do you have a detox unit? Do you work with methadone centers or suboxone centers? We have our own, we have our own possible unit at the jail. And First question we have for people are, are you high, are you on drugs, are you detoxing? So they have a, we have a, a hospital area with about 25 beds in it, sometimes it's over full. So and certain drugs, as you may be familiar with, certain take longer to detox from alcohol, so the longest detox. It takes about a week or so to detox, when you detox from alcohol, other drugs are short of time. But we have them, we have them, and it's a very big part of our, our unfortunately, our budget and our operation is the medical portion, and a big part of the medical unit is the detox unit. Uh, from that. And once we transition people out, we work very hard with programming to get inmates into a substance abuse program once they get out. No matter where, we first find out where they're going, hopefully they have a place to stay, that's number one, and then we sort of find out support networks. And you know, some people take advantage of it, some don't. We can't force people to do it. And the other piece I'll just mention on the, the, the number of Americans incarcerated, clearly that's an absolute statistical fact, so no, no doubt. And I know a lot of people take exception to it, as, as I can understand. I just want to state, I think it's a little bit more complex. We have, I can only judge it by this. I think the fact we're the most sort of, um, most diverse country sort of in the world, it creates a lot of tensions and things where, uh, I, I, for example, I got flown to Colombia, South America, to, to work at the University of Bogota, was hired by the, the, the country, the, the Colombian government, to design and develop a better incarceration system than what they have. They had the incarceration part down, they had no programs, and they were over capacity. So they had to double the size of their prison prisons. And they wanted to figure out how to design them based on true, effective principle and practices, not just throw the key away. So when I went down there, I toured some of the Colombian prisons in Bogota, and it was astonishing the cultural differences, you know? They would have inmates out like for 15 hours a day just in the in the, in the uh, just in the open yard. I'm like, oh, that seems Kind of nice, but you know, if we did that, guys, we killing each other. You know what I mean? There's just, it's, and I looked at this population, and it was different. I'm just saying a fact, it was different. They're very homogenous, and it seemed to have so. There's a lot of different reasons, but I think I can't explain why. I don't have a clear explanation of why. I think we understand that our carcer rates are too high, and I think that's where I've been blessed to be sheriff. I think we're on the cutting edge, and I really do mean it in the sense of the last five or ten years, especially the awareness issue that. Warehousing, the term warehousing inmates doesn't work. I mean, I'm not looking to spend, you know, fifty thousand dollars on someone who's committed crimes and gone to prison, right? I mean, I don't want to spend your money like that. I'd rather spend it on education or public safety or healthcare for people. I mean, things that are you know, better for us as a society. But we have this problem. We do have crime. And we've got to find ways to drive it down. We're never going to eliminate it. And we do believe that the type of programming, find people when they bottom out. Give them the opportunity to turn their lives around. And I'll say this, one of the greatest moments I ever shared, we have an institute, when I was sheriff, anger management class. I'll give you one example, just one example. Anger management class. We have a graduation ceremony about every six months. It's a real class, by the way. Sometimes before I got there, there was an attitude that, well, if you just went in and signed in, you get the good time, you went back to your cell, you get out early. Well, I was like, what the heck is going on here? Like, we're going to have real teachers with real programs, and if you're, not, if you're an inmate and you're not participating, you're out. No good time. You're out. You're going to be held accountable. But if you work hard, we're going to give you an opportunity. So classes matter. And these anger management classes are one of my favorites, and we teach people how to deal with anger issues. Now, you know, a lot of people incarcerated, hey, like most people in society know how they anger, you know, we deal with. These guys have a very hard time with it. And I give you an example. One inmate gets up to me at the end, and I love to go to these. And believe me, if you ever wanted to come, I'd probably take you inside to see it, because I do bring occasionally people in to see this program. Because I love it so much, because the inmates will see at the end, and I personally hand them their graduation certificate. Sometimes it's the first time they've gotten a positive, you know, positive reinforcement in their lives. And we tell them this is not the end, this is the beginning, and that you do have a chance to turn your lives around. And I ask them, would you like to share your thoughts on what's going on? 
And they will tell me constantly like how they, this has helped them so much, and they know they're going to do this, that, and the other. But then the proof is in the pudding. I'm up in Lamister, a plastics factory, last year, maybe a couple years ago now, and I need an inmate. Now, some of our inmates get transitioned to work there because they, they have a feeder system. And I actually find that sometimes inmates can make very good if they're cleared properly, but really good employees. So I meet one of my inmates there, and the owner says, he was one of your guys. And the guy says, yeah, sure. Do you remember me, blah, blah, blah? And I said, yeah, I do remember. You were my member class. He goes, I wasn't any of your management class. He goes, that's the reason I'm still working. Because I've still got, I, I have two kids, I just got married, and I'm still working feeding my family because of that. So what do you mean? Now, I'm just telling you what he said. You're going to hear this, and you're like, you got to be kidding me. But trust me, this is the average in me. He says, I'll try to be gently say this. The language up there is a little different than I usually have up there. Sometimes i got to, let's just say, he said when he got there the first day, uh, the owner told him, you know, trained him how to do it and told him to go. And the first day on the line, his supervisor comes over and says, hey, John, you're doing it all wrong. And he goes, my first inclination was to flip on the bird, tell him who the F do you think you are, and I probably would have been fired. But I thought about what I learned and how to handle this situation. And he was so proud to tell me that he thought to ask the supervisor, could you ask the owner? He told me I should operate the machine this way. Could you please, could we get him down? So the owner came down. They discussed it. He goes, I was right. They, uh, there was some misunderstanding, but we clarified it. And ever since then, it's been working great. And the, the supervisor says to me, this is one of our best employees. He wouldn't have lasted one day, maybe without that anger management class. Now imagine that. I mean, I think most of us know flipping off your boss is not a great idea. <laughs> but some folks don't have any other way. So we try to teach those. That's just one of the several things we try to do to help people out there. But it's just a good example of a real life situation. Yes? What percentage of people have jobs when they get off? Very low. I wouldn't say not like zero, not 5%. For example, the inmates that work in the inmate work programs, the ones shoveling, the ones, these are our better inmates. I go visit those programs as much as possible. And I assure you, no matter where you live in Worcester County, we've been to your community. Um, and we're out there doing it. And when I ask my inmates how long you have, most have less than six months, where are you going? Almost all of them have a place to go and have something lined up. So that population does very well, you know, but they again, they're cleared, they're best, better inmates. I would say they are probably 70% employed when they leave. You know, they go back to a carpentry or painting or, or doing landscaping or something like that. Some of them have even more skills like, uh, you know, car, like um, masonry and things like that. But I would say the average, I would say the, the employment rate of the average inmate getting released is probably 30 to 40 percent. You know, it's hard enough to get a job when you're unemployed these days. It's even harder when you've got a criminal record. Um, so it's something that we, you know, I will say, that's part of the reason why I do this outreach program with my inmates, because I want people to understand, and I'm not here to tell you every inmate, you know, take a shot at them, but some of them do deserve that opportunity. And if I can humanize them in a way to give them an opportunity, some of them deserve it. And if they can turn their lives around, we're all better off for it, you know? We're all better off. Some deserve that right, some don't. But the employment rate isn't zero, but it's certainly tough. And if anybody here is willing as an employer, to reach out to me and say, I'd be interested in talking to you. I'm having uh, Central's Los Americanos here in Worcester. Central's coming to meet me this week. What they want to do is start some businesses with ex-offenders. They want to start a print shop. They want to start, I think it's a landscaping shop. They want to start those with offenders to come in and work for them and uh, develop that kind of business model. And I'm all for trying to help foster that because, you know, Ronald Reagan once said, the best social program is a job. I've always believed that. I'm trying to envision when you send a team into a neighborhood. All I can think of is a paddy wagon with uh, orange jumpsuits and a chain gang jumping out of the back of the paddy wagon. They well, first of all, not, I won't say the word paddy wagon because that has a. Uh, you know, I'm just joking. You know, I don't like this. <laughs> but uh, what do you? You know, no. So you're envisioning. So. So they have regular street clothes on. Um, they have. Uh, they come up in a van, it's a marked van, Worcester County Sheriff's Department, it's a, it's a transpo van. Um, they arrive on the scene around probably 8, 8.30 in the morning. Um, they're supervised, they usually have similar kind of clothing, a blue shirt and jeans um, and work boots. And we will give them like anything like gloves if they need them or the, or the site will provide the gloves, uh, hats if it's winter time, things like that, coats. But they're, you know, they're not, they're not, um, they're not in pink jumpsuits, if you know some sheriffs do that. 
Um, but that's kind of their dress. They're supervised. They're kind of nondescript. I, 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 you wouldn't really notice, unless you really looked and you see the van, you probably think mostly they were just a work crew out there doing the work. And if you look a little closer, they're dressed a little more similarly than the average work crew, uh, and they're supervised and things like that. But it, it's it's really nondescript. I don't think, you know, like I said, I've had, I mean, not to hold honestly, it's been one of the best parts of any program I have with the department because we have done so much good for the community, and I know we've helped some people find their way. We're getting close to <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I can also say the sheriff has donated an auction item too, so round of applause for that. Yeah. And we do have a reserve deputy sheriff association, which is a volunteer organization, and if any of you are interested to join it, I think Brad's a member. Um, we have Carolyn's a member too. I don't know if Dave. Dave's a member. Yeah, so I remember how we got it. But um, we do a lot of good. We do all these things. Like what she's about donates a thousand coats for our winter coat drive. We donated. We gave away three thousand coats last year to needy families. We did twenty-five tons of food to families over Thanksgiving. It's a charitable organization. If anybody would be interested in joining us, that's just a great organization. We have about six, seven hundred members, and it's a really nice group. It's all basically charitable, volunteer work. So. Thank you all. Yep, I can catch up on each table. I don't want to hold you all up. Yeah. I want to thank you for being a good neighbor. I was going to say, I recognize you. That's why I work for oh, making yourself you. available to us any number of times. And also, thank you, my church in West Ferguson, that's been the recipient of your food course this past summer. So Not even paying to say that. See, there you go, right there. <laughs> it's amazing how Briarwood is literally, parts of Briarwood are bordering our property. But we try hard to be a good neighbor, and we try to help you with our crews and um, the work in the church. So, yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.